Today on The Dugs, we debate what it means to pilfer a base, how the origin story of the Cleveland Indians and Chief Wahoo is so much dumber than you think, and much, much more alongside the thrilling conclusion of this playoff series. Put your eyeballs in, put your eyeballs out, put your eyeballs in, and don't freaking blink. The Dugs have uploaded a new video. Welcome back to the Ducks. Everything we do here is an excuse to tell a lot of baseball stories and a lot of jokes. So if that sounds interesting to you, stay in the know and help us grow with a free subscription to our channel. This video has a lot of standalone content, but it's also part of a series. So if you want to start at the beginning, the link to the playlist is dropping in at the top of this video right now. On with the video. The Tucson Tucsoons have already advanced to the championship playoff. Today's video is going to figure out who is going to meet them there. Let's get right into it. The Diamonds in the Rough take the invitation quite literally as Tony Gwynn leads the game off with a single, and then Paul Goldschmidt grabs the intercom mic and says, with the owner of a strong start to the game, please report to customer services. Your ass just got blown up. Two to nothing Diamonds before Club Snub can record an out. Well, Diamonds pitcher Fergie Jenkins has got to feel just dandy about that. That is until the sixth pitch of the game also leaves the yard off the bat of Bill Dolan. No surprise there. Even in the dead ball era, Bill was leading the league for multiple seasons in the home run category. He was also credited with 548 stolen bases in his career, but it bears noting that the stolen base did not always mean what it means today. Anytime you took an extra base off of one of your teammates hits, that's a steal. Went first to third on a single, that's a steal. Though at times it wasn't a steal exactly. The term stolen base didn't come around until 1870. Five or seven years prior to that, Ned Cuthbert swiped the first bag when the pitcher became distracted and he just took off for second. It's possible a lady had gotten her ankles out for the boys. Since it occurred prior to the term stolen base, if you go looking for a mention of the event, you'll have to look for what they called it back then, skedaddling on the make. The very next inning, the Diamonds are digging themselves a hole. Bob Johnson reaches on this error by Fergie Jenkins and advances to second, which is big, because with two outs, Burt Blylevin steps to the plate and despite being a terrible career hitter, laces a ground ball through the infield and brings Johnson around to score from second. That is a soft, soft game-tying run. Would you like to see some harder runs? Jim Edmonds leads off the inning with a solo shot and gives club snub the lead and the very next batter in Bob Johnson very much dislikes baseballs and obliterates this one. Those back-to-back -back jacks puts the snubs up too. Hamish set the tone earlier in the season by masterfully dodging mentioning Bob Johnson's moniker of Indian Bob by renaming him Guardian Bob. But to be fair, Bob got the nickname because he was a quarter Cherokee. In the early days of baseball, though not common, full-blooded Native Americans could be found on major league teams much more frequently than they are today. There are two Hall of Famers that were full-blooded and Chief Ben who shares a nickname with Hamish in college, and Zach Wheat. That's actually where the Indians got their name from. Teams didn't have official names in the early days of baseball. The Indians, sorry, sorry, Guardians were actually named the Naps unofficially for a bit because before he was a diamond in the rough, Nap Lajoie was the only good thing going on in Cleveland. Not the Cleveland Baseball Club, the entire city. However, Nap left after the 1914 season and despite it being Cleveland, continuing on with the moniker of a man that has decided to part ways with your squad was a little bit pathetic even by their standards. So instead, one rumor has it that they like the idea of extending the tradition of naming the team after a player. So instead of honoring Knapp, they decided to honor a player from well before Knapp's time. That was essentially kicked off the team for his issues with alcohol abuse, both on and off the field. Louis Sakalexis, a full-blooded Native American of the Penobscot Nation, was a star for the Cleveland Spiders for a brief period of time and is thought to be inspiration behind the first sports riders giving the team the nickname Indians, which eventually snowballed to the club adopting the name formally. If you think the logo was obviously a terrible idea that could have never been dreamt up by a functioning adult, you'd be right. The original logo was put together by a 17-year-old when owner Bill Veek commissioned a new logo from the JF Novak Company. The thing is, you can only blame the 17-year-old so much. You'd expect this original logo to get better over time, but it arguably got much, much worse as others started putting their own spin on it. Its final iteration, which was retired after the 2018 season, features a red-skinned Indian head. Now there's a lot of debate over whether the term redskin is a derogatory term or not, with some pointing to research that suggests that the term originated among Native Americans themselves, but I do know that redskin is likely not something that would come out of my mouth if I were talking to a Native American. My uh, Cleveland spider sense is tingling and telling me to get back into the game before I manage to piss off everyone. So uh, let's go do that. So 
where are we at? Club Snub has taken a 4-2 lead, but it doesn't last long. Nap Lajue steps up to the plate, and it's my dinger, and I need it now. 4-3. And you know who we haven't mentioned much this postseason? Mike Trout. Well, here's Mike Trout tying the game at four with a solo shot of his own. And that's where the score remains until the bottom of the seventh. Dr. Death Danny Darwin is back on the mound for Diamonds in the Rough. And have you ever wondered what would happen if Death let his hormones get the better of him and he touched himself? Well, it likely would look a lot like this. This is a Todd Helton two-run home run, putting the snubs up six to four. Danny Darwin is straight up not having a good time. So far in this tourney, he's yet to have a clean appearance, hitting the mound three times and giving up eight earned runs in three innings of work. Is this the lead that's finally going to be the one that holds up? It's the top of the eighth now, and Billy Wagner comes out to pitch. Luke Appling hits a one-out single. Pitcher spot is up next, so Joe Torre comes in to pinch hit, and that is going to be a double. And so we have men at second and third. Nothing is easy in the playoffs. Andrew McCutcheon is up next as he pinch hits for Tony Gwynn. Tony's arguably the best contact hitter of all time, but whatever, let's get stupid. McCutcheon singles, and that scores Luke Appling. Torrey will have to hold up at third, but no worries. Paul Goldschmidt's up, and he's been one of the best hitters this postseason, hitting 370 with three home runs. Oh, but he goes down swinging in a huge strikeout for Billy Wagner. And so tying the game will fall on the shoulders of Nat Lajue. That doesn't look dangerous. And Club Snub gets out of it, still clinging to a one-run lead, and are three outs away from advancing to the championship round. Nothing happens in the bottom of the eighth, so that one-run difference is where we sit at in the ninth. The Snubs are going to leave Billy Wagner in as he attempts to get a six-out save. It looks like he's quite determined to not let it get close again. Mike Trout? Down swinging. Harmon Killebrew? Down swinging. Joe Maurer? Oh, Joe Maurer singles, and so the tying run reaches base. That leaves it up to Ernie Banks, and that looks like it might be a flyout. It is! We are down to the final two of the tourney. The championship series will feature Club Snub taking on the Tucson Two Series. Let's wrap this one up. It's close but no cigar for the Diamonds as a number of offensive contributors pitched in to catapult the snubs past them in the playoffs. Bob Johnson had several big hits, including a double and his fourth home run of the series. And then, of course, it was Todd Helton who broke the tie in the eighth and blew this one open. For the Diamonds, Fergie struggled early and the bullpen was mostly helpful until Danny Darwin got in there and continued to embarrass himself in his post-professional career. Both Joe Maurer and Luke Appling managed three hits in the game, but they were just outlasted, and that is how their tournament will end. We are going to take a short break to wrap up the production of the championship videos. We can tell you that the first two games will start at the home of Club Snub, and the pitching matchups are as follows. In Game 1, it's the snubs Tommy John against the Too Soon Smokey Joe Wood. And in Game 2, the Too Soon Sandy Koufax takes on club snubs Brett Saberhagen. As we did in our previous video, I do want to add on some content to the end of this video here to leave it a mystery to viewers whether a Game 7 was required or not, so we'll once again be running a brief rerun from our previous season. Now, we're not going to have the time to put another one of these together for this season, but last season we put together a hype video and hired a voiceover actor to narrate it. It's one of my favorite things that we've done, so make sure to stick around and watch if you haven't seen it before. So, we'll see you real soon. As always, I've been Johnny Paprika, hoping all of your balls are fair and all of your wood is good. Good night, everybody! A storm is coming. That storm. She is Playoff Baseball. Eight teams entered the dubs. Four have emerged alive. Union Jacks have the entire weight of a nation on their shoulders. Did you bet on any coming the first round of the game? The 
deliberately offensive have destroyed the notion that you need pitchers on your team. And he's got him. Babe Ruth up with Holy men on the first and ding dong the pitch is done. Hide your children because Barry's just hit a dinger. The weak prescriptions can't see or throw good. Base is loaded again for Dante Bichette. And Cinderella must have shut her curfew because, because that's a long ball. Five seasons and never see a performance quite like The big bones have spent a lifetime not being able to fit into tight spaces. Back for all. Call it all. Call it all. It's time to play ball. Actually, Johnny and Hamish have paid me to say 100 words. So they tell me they're going to get their money's worth. Come quiet. Come quiet. Come quiet. Come quiet.